Keeping your pet happy and healthy, that's what Chewy is all about, which is why we offer veterinary diets, prescriptions, even compounded medications customized for your pet so you can get what they need to feel good. Shop America's number one pet pharmacy. Visit Chewy.com today. Imagine an ER waiting room with your favorite blanket and pillow, your cat's pixel and widget, and your mom's chicken soup. At Dignity Health, we know the only thing worse than being in pain is being stuck in an ER waiting room. So we offer in quicker. You get an estimated ER arrival time online so you can start your wait at home. It's just another way of putting leading edge medicine within easy reach. Learn more at strosehospitals.org slash ER. Dignity Health, including St. Rose Dominicans, Rose de Lima, San Martin, and Siena campuses in Henderson and Las Vegas. Hello, human kindness. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 427. What's up, everybody, and greetings from Sin City. Usually right now, we'd be about an hour deep into the live stream, but your boy was running way behind schedule today, so I decided to scrap the live stream altogether rather than starting it late, and instead... We're going to do this Daily Drop episode. Now, next Sunday, we'll be right back at it. But this weekend, altogether, I have been absolutely lazy. And folks, it has felt pretty good. I haven't really relaxed like this, like I have this weekend, in a real long time. So it was nice to kind of recharge the batteries. You know, we still have the one episode out every day. And then the flashback episodes. But it was nice to just chill with the family. Like, um, yesterday, I spent pretty much... The whole entire day over at my parents hanging out with my pops and my mom and my uncle and Carrie, of course. And we were watching all kinds of sports and just, you know, enjoying the day. And literally, I didn't do a thing. Like, no decision making was was occurring, nothing. I sat around, I ate, and I watched sports. And folks, it was glorious. And I needed it. To tell you the truth, I needed it. It was... uh. Very refreshing to chill and recharge and to just hang out and be, as we would say, where I'm from, a mushkaleen. But instead of the live stream tonight, because of, you know, me being a general lazy bum the whole weekend and ending up running behind schedule tonight, you know, we're going to do this daily drop and we lucked out. Kate Bricklet has a new article out over at the Daily Beast detailing the relationship between Jeffrey Epstein and Woody Allen. And as usual, Kate hit the ball out of the park. You know, she's one of the very few reporters throughout this whole entire thing that has really stayed on target and done just great work. Really has done a lot to bring attention to what goes on. And it's been fantastic to see her continue to cover this story and give it the attention it deserves. Not too many people in the legacy media have done that, and Kate has certainly been one of them carrying the torch. So, as much as I am a curmudgeon and I can be critical of the legacy media, and Lord knows that's about 97% of the time or somewhere around there, there when, when, when good stuff happens and there's, you know, um, journalists who do the right thing and follow the case and look for truth no matter where it takes them, you got to give a, a tip of the cap to them as well, right? Because it, it's not re- it's not really the journalists, folks, in my opinion. It's the editorial rooms and the people who own these companies. You know, all of these um, big-time legacy media companies are owned by a handful of people. And with that in mind... They get to shape what the national conversation is. So they they wield extreme power and they have extreme responsibilities, in my opinion, to make sure that they're using that power correctly. And what we have seen in the last, at the very least, since Clinton has been president, has been an absolute shit show by the media. So whenever we have somebody like Kate over there at the Daily Beast who hammers these so-called elites and keeps on 
keeping on by reporting the story and following the evidence wherever it may lead, you got to make sure you give them a, a tip of the cap. And I'm sure all of you out there who are listening to this podcast anyway have followed her on Twitter. If you're active on Twitter, make sure you give her a follow and make sure you check out the article as well. You know, uh, follow the link that will be in the description box. That way, you know, you get to read along with uh, with me or afterwards and you follow all the different hyperlinks and, you know, it will direct you to other articles that Kate has um, authored as well within this article. So make sure you click that hyperlink. Make sure you go and check out the article. And if you're not doing so, make sure you give Kate a follow over on Twitter. All right, folks. So, like I said, the content tonight, Jeffrey Epstein and Woody Allen. Does the disgust factor get any higher? I mean, two absolute disgusting people in my opinion. Now, I have to preface this with, I have not watched the Woody Allen documentary on HBO yet. So I am not completely in the know about the Woody Allen allegations um, with uh, his, his daughter. Right, I'm not too hip to the whole entire ins and outs the way I am with the Jeffrey Epstein case. I have a basic knowledge of it, of course, but I'm not, you know, locked in. So I'm I'm going to watch that documentary, um, probably starting tonight, to be honest with you. But it's it's just with all of this like deep ass dark content that we cover here on the Jeffrey Epstein show, it's it's a tough pill to swallow to sit down and dive into other cases that are dark and disgusting and disturbing as well. Um, I've had several, several different people send me, you know, links and articles about, you know, different situations like this, like the Jeffrey Epstein case. And I read them all, but it's, I mean, it's a really dark subject, right? So as much time as I spend on the Jeffrey Epstein case and this show, I try not to delve too deep into other <laughs> dark places, right? And once this case ends, obviously that'll change and we'll, we'll move on to other things and we'll hyper-focus on, you know, we'll, we'll hyper-focus on things as well, topics. But I just, uh, you know, this kind of stuff is just deep and heavy, folks. And to talk about it every day the way we do... It's if it wasn't such an important situation, in my opinion, there is no way in hell I would be carving out the time I do to talk about something like this. It skeeves me out. It's completely skeevy. All of it, all of the participants, all of the players, all of the people that let it happen, all of the law law enforcement officials that never stepped forward to protect these girls. It's all disgusting and disturbing. But besides very few in the legacy media. Nobody's telling the story. So that's where we all come in, right? Not just me. Because like I always say, I'm not a journalist. I'm just like you folks, you know, just a concerned-ass citizen who happened to start a podcast that that resonates with a few people. But besides that, I'm just your average, everyday, you know, typical moron like everybody else. But uh, how much can you sit back and take? How much can you let slide by? Like, my whole life, I knew that these politicians and people in business and all of the, that jazz, I knew that they were all the thieves and criminals and crooks, but basically, you know, monetar- monetarily type uh, heists and stuff like that. Stealing, and I, I knew that was occurring, and I knew bribes, and, but when you start pulling back the curtain, and you see what these people truly are involved in, and maybe not involved in, per se, as, you know, being the ones doing the abuse... But the enabling of it, the fostering of these people's reputations and being the vehicle for them to move into so-called polite society cannot be ignored. We're just going to ignore the fact that you gave the pyromaniac the matches that he set the whole entire neighborhood on fire with? We're just going to ignore that. And for a long time it was ignored. But now... People are starting to see what's going on, and these people are getting called out. People like Woody Allen. How long are you going to hide behind the fact that you're a, a filmmaker that's, you know, people love your films? How long are you going to use that as your, your shield? And how long are people 
going to continue to protect him because you like his movies. How gross. It's, it's, it's really sickening to me. Who cares if the guy made some great movies? Big deal. Still a disgusting asshole. Still shouldn't be palling around with Jeffrey Epstein. And if the allegations from um, uh, Dylan Farrow are true, then this guy is a heinous, disgusting, barbarous piece of shit. And there is certainly a place for him right next to his pal Jeffrey Epstein on the lowest rung of hell. So, it's nice to see that people like Woody Allen are getting called out for this stuff finally. Because we've been blowing these people up for how long? I mean, every day, all day, it seems like. And we only have so much reach, of course, right? I mean, especially with iTunes playing their games, you know, it's it's a tough nut to crack to try and get more listeners and to expand our audience. But we're still doing a great job, and that's all because of you, obviously, sharing it with your friends and whatnot. I mean, you know... It is a message that needs to get out there. And the fact that we have this sort of uh, article in the Daily Beast, especially when the subject of Woody Allen is so hot right now, it can only serve to get more eyes on the story of Epstein and maybe start to educate other people who, like, you know, I call them the unsullied, people who don't know much about the Epstein case, maybe this opens the door for them. And the more people who are aware of what went on here, and the poor, the more people who are aware of the travesty that occurred, the better. Because I don't know how anyone can look at what happened here and not be outraged. All right, so this article is from the Daily Beast, and the headline: Inside Woody Allen's close friendship with Jeffrey Epstein, and there is a picture of Woody Allen. And he's wearing some shades, right? Or glasses or whatever. And inside of the glasses, there's a picture of Jeffrey Epstein staring at you. Kind of like in his eyes, where his eyes would be. There's a whole picture of Jeffrey Epstein instead. So, pretty cool picture as well. So again, make sure you check out these links. When I put them in the description box, definitely make sure you check them out. Because there's always like hyperlinks within the story that will add some more context if you want to delve a bit deeper. And you all know how I feel about context. All right, so this article, like I said, was authored by Kate Bricklett and Marlo Stern, the senior entertainment editor, and Kate is the senior reporter. Over the past several weeks, audiences have been watching and endlessly debating Alan vs. Farrow, the eye-opening HBO docuseries examining Dylan Farrow's allegation that on August 4th, 1992, her adoptive father, Woody Allen, took a seven-year-old Dylan up to the attic of their Connecticut country home and molested her. Yo, I mean, just right off the bat, folks. I mean, how much more sinister and dark and disturbing does it get? Your seven-year-old adoptive daughter? Taking her up to an attic to molest her? What sort of demonic, sick bastard do you have to be for that to occur? And now again, I, I don't know this story inside and out, right? The the Woody Allen story here. I do not know the the ins and the outs and both both sides of the story the same way I do with the Epstein case. But I will tell you this. From what little I do know, and again, this is a case that's been around for decades. This is not something that has just happened where there's a bunch of smoke and there's no... It's none of that gray area here with this Woody Allen character. Quite obvious to me that this dude is probably a disgusting prick, right? Can I prove that? Absolutely not. Again, I'm just uh, some knucklehead sitting here in his home studio talking to you on a podcast. I don't have any inside information about any of this shit. But I will tell you this. Woody Allen definitely has some explaining to do. I mean, this uh, this this lady, Dylan Farrow, who was a child then, obviously, but she has been very adamant about this for a very long time. And as far as I know, there has there been a, a strong investigation into this Woody Allen character. If it was just a regular Joe Schmo, the plumber. And his seven year his his daughter said that this occurred. Pretty sure that there would be an investigation. At least you hope so, right? So why wouldn't Woody Allen be investigated? 
Where's Cyrus Vance and all of the other people in New York? All these big loudmouths that run around and stand atop their ivory towers while at the same time letting people like Epstein and Weinstein and Rainieri run roughshod all over New York. Where are all of these tough lawmakers from the SDNY? Ah, uh, sure. Give me a break. The film, whose fourth and final chapter airs Sunday, March 14th, provides testimony from numerous members of the Pharaoh Previn clan, including Dylan, her brother Ronan, and their mother Mia. Eyewitness accounts from family, friends, neighbors, and hired help. Interviews with state and city officials in New York and Connecticut. Never before heard recordings of phone calls between Woody and Mia. And unearthed documents from the New York and Connecticut investigations into Dylan's welfare. Okay, so I guess there was an investigation into Dylan's welfare. Now, like I said, I am not 100% hip on how deep the investigation went or anything like that. I'm sure there are some of you out there listening who are completely locked into this case as well. And I'm sure I'll be getting some emails from you. And thank you, because like I always say, I learn as much from you folks out there as you might learn from me. Because the emails I get and some of the conversations I have... They prov- it, prov- it provides a lot of context, and it's it's always something that I am thankful for. So make sure send send over those emails if you if you're locked into this case and you have some resources for me so I could uh, maybe bring myself up to speed a little bit better on the Woody Allen case. Definitely send it over, and I'll give it a look. Allen and Soon Yi, who declined to participate in the series, released a written statement through Allen's sister, calling it a hatchet job riddled with falsehoods and the abuse claim categorically false. Yeah, that's pretty much what they all say and what you expect him to say here, right? What's he going to say? Nah, she's right. That's exactly what I did. Cowards like this don't ever own up to anything. Never mind something as heinous as this. Kirby Dick and Amy Ziering the filmmaking team behind Allen vs. Farrow feel that the Annie Hall filmmaker, whose behavior toward Dylan was deemed grossly inappropriate by a judge in the child custody trial he lost, should merely hide behind a prepared statement. Wow. Okay. Well then. A judge deemed that the behavior towards Dylan was grossly inappropriate? What the hell does that mean, folks? Grossly inappropriate. Can we have some clarification, please? No no hide behind the, oh, grossly inappropriate, or like with the DOJ, oh, it was a mistake. No, none of that shit. Can we get some frank talk, please? Is that too much to ask? grossly inappropriate. If he took her upstairs and he molested her like she alleges he did, it's a lot more than grossly inappropriate, folks. If you had nothing to hide and you were really being falsely maligned, wouldn't you want to speak to journalists? Zeering told the Daily Beasts. What are you afraid of? And I, you know what? That's a two-edged sword, honestly. Let's be real here. Nobody want, Nobody's running out to talk to the media these days. We all know how the media basically runs hatchet jobs on everybody. So nobody's running out to speak to the media. So I get that, right? I don't even. I, I can't really fault the guy for that shit, especially considering he, <laughs> it doesn't look like he's innocent. So probably not uh, not the best idea to take a page from Joe Exotic of the Windsor family's playbook, right? Probably keep your mouth shut. But. This dude right here, Woody Allen, most certainly, most certainly should answer some hard questions. One thing Woody Allen is not afraid of is defending powerful men who have been credibly accused of sexual misconduct. No, he has no problem with that. Now, see, this is the part about Woody Allen's life that I know something about, right? You know, Roman Polanski, Jeffrey Epstein, Weinstein. He has been notorious for defending these predators, right? And we're not talking about gray area stuff, folks, okay? See, because when, when we're talking about gray area, I okay, fine. If there's an argument to be had, like usual, I am ready and willing to always listen to both sides of the argument. So, wherever the evidence leads is where we go. 
But there's no gray area here, okay? When you're def- defending people like Polanski or Epstein or Weinstein. It makes you more than a fellow traveler. It makes you an enabler. And it also makes you somebody who is refurbishing and helping a convicted pedophile. You're helping them. You're a big movie star. Everything you say can be used by this person to say, hey, well, look, I'm not that bad. Woody Allen wants to hang out with me. Meanwhile, normal thinking people are like, oh, Woody Allen wants to hang out with you? Oh, it doesn't shock me. You're both disgusting predators. So yeah, par for the course. He served as one of Roman Polanski's most vocal defenders, saying the fugitive filmmaker is a nice person who's paid his dues for raping a 13-year-old girl and then fleeing the country. And in the immediate wake of the sexual assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein, accused the the movie mogul's victims of conducting a witch hunt against him before walking it back. Oh yeah, I'm sure it was, and and I'm sure it wasn't Woody Allen who decided to walk it back. I'm sure it was whatever shitbag publicist company, Peggy Siegel maybe, or whoever the hell it is he has working for him, who came riding in on their horse and in their white shining armor to tell him to walk that back, because that's not a good look, right? Eh, defending Harvey Weinstein? Probably not the best look. Then you add on his defense of Roman Polanski, the coward-ass chump who raped a girl in America and then scooted to France like the big-ass punk chump he is. And that alone right there should show you folks why Ghislaine Maxwell was remanded to custody without bail. Roman Polanski might be powerful, he might be wealthy, but he didn't have anywhere near the contacts that Ghislaine Maxwell has. And then there is his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. It's not clear when Allen and Epstein first crossed paths, though the two were longtime friends and neighbors on Manhattan's Upper East Side for years. So my guess is they've been friends for years, right? These guys are, they all roll in these kinds of circles. They all are very um, clicky, right? They're, They're not hanging out with the local plumber. They're not going out with the grocer. They're hanging out with other scumbags that could either do something for them or that they can manipulate into doing something for them, right? It's, it's, it's always, it's always a situation with these people where it's, what can you do for me? The director and his wife, Sunyi Previn, have been photographed a few times leaving the financier's townhouse pedophile, including in September 2013, five years after Epstein pleaded guilty to child prostitution charges, when a page six headline declared, Woody Allen pals around with child sex creep. Well, fellow travelers and all, folks. What, you you don't think these two disgusting pieces of garbage sat there and talked about their proclivities? It gives me the chills to think about what their conversation could have entailed. Because when you look at all of the information from all of the years and all of the people that have come forward, it does not paint a pretty picture of Woody Allen. Then you add to it his defense of Polanski, his uh, his defense of uh, Weinstein, his friendship in defense of Epstein. It's not a good look. This is not somebody who is concerned about what's going on in society, right? This is somebody who's like, oh, well, this is the way I live my life, too. So there's nothing wrong with that. Why are you guys criticizing them? How dare you? These people, I'll tell you what, these people truly have a, a different a different mentality, folks. And I'll never understand the so-called elite. I will never understand them. Epstein was hugging him and talking close to his ear and had his arm on Woody's shoulder. One witness told the tabloid, adding that the pals appeared to enjoy a stroll down Madison Avenue before arriving at Epstein's seven-story mansion. Oh, isn't that cute? These two sick, disgusting bastards taking a stroll down Madison Avenue. Cue the cameras. I mean... How many more instances do we need to see of Jeffrey Epstein with people like Woody Allen? And correct me if I'm wrong, but 
wasn't Woody Allen at a party with Chelsea Handler that she came out and talked about recently where everybody gave her a pass? Nobody was like, what the hell are you doing at the party? It was like a, a, a jokeable moment or something to these people. Instead of asking her hard questions, they just let it pass. Oh, you were there? That's cool. No big deal. Oh, you were a guest? No deep questions. No, none of that. I wonder why. Diplomat Terry Rod Larson joined this walk, along with his friend filmmaker Hakan Gunderson, who told the Norwegian newspaper DN last October, I heard that Epstein knew Woody Allen and several other famous film producers. With my background, I thought it was very interesting. Oh, did you now? You thought it was very interesting, did you? We covered um, Terry Rod uh, Larson on one of the drops I don't know when all of this was happening a few months ago. I'll have to go back through the catalog, maybe drop that as a flashback episode for a little more context, considering we're talking about him now. But he's just another one of these politicians, one of these European politicians that was seen palling around with Epstein as well, that had known ties to Epstein as well. And another person that uses the marathon defense. Oh, I don't know to put distance between him and Epstein. Oh, I don't I don't know anything about Jeffrey Epstein. We only met once. What do you mean? Another one of those guys. When Allen arrived, Epstein allegedly told Gunderson, Here, you will meet someone else who is also very interested in film. Gunderson said they all visited Central Park for about two hours that day before heading back to Epstein's home. Woody Allen and Soon Yi did not respond to multiple requests for comment for this story. You know, when, I've, when I was in New York, when I live there and when I visit, I spend a lot of time in Central Park. A lot of time in Central Park. Such a beautiful place. And to think about these two scumbags lurking in there, walking through there, having their little talk, the fact that Ghislaine Maxwell used to use it, uh, uh, allegedly as a, uh, a fertile hunting ground for nubiles, it's just disgusting. These people literally corrupt everything they touch and everything they're involved with. Around the same time, Epstein hosted another dinner at his, at his New York home, where he introduced Allen to a connection at MIT. Oh, good old academia, always popping its ugly head up, isn't it? Joy Ito, former director of the MIT Media Lab, met other influential individuals at meetings with Epstein, including, including Woody Allen, a senior executive at the Hyatt Corporation, and a former prime minister of Israel according to a report commissioned by the school on its ties to Epstein. Oh, a Hyatt Corporation, huh? A senior executive at the Hyatt Corporation, huh? Okay, right. And a former prime minister of Israel. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. I wonder who that could be. Does name start with an E, maybe? Last name? Start with a B? Perhaps? MIT staff even raised the possibility that Epstein would bring Allen to campus during his October 2013 visit. What would Woody Allen have to do with MIT? What would he be doing with Jeffrey Epstein going to MIT? Is Woody Allen a scientist? He's going to go help Joy Ito out in the science department of MIT? I thought this guy made stupid movies. Ridiculous movies that, to be honest with you, and... I I don't know who the hell out there watches these things, but I, I honestly don't know how anyone could sit through one of this guy's movies. Absolute garbage, crap, atrociousness. Never liked Woody Allen, never thought he was talented, never thought his movies were good, none of that jazz. Garbage. Boring garbage. Ito expressed concern that inviting Epstein and Woody Allen to campus could create a public relations headache for MIT, the report states. And, and see, again, it's not because they're scumbags. It's not because they're dirtbags or that they've been involved in uh, abusing children, allegedly. One of them, anyway, allegedly. It's none of that. It's that it could bring bad press. It's not that we think they're scumbags and we don't like them, but it could bring bad press. You see, it's not about caring that these people are dirty or they're, they're, they're sick or they're pedophiles in Epstein's case. It's not about that because they don't care. They care about the money. That's it. That's all these sick academics care about. All these people in academia. 
all these people like Joy Ito and all of the trustees, all of those type of folks. And it's gross. And you see it over and over and over again by their own statements. Apparently, citing the Page Six story, Ito tried to dissuade Epstein from bringing Allen. Since you two were just in the news recently, I wonder if that might be bad, Ito emailed the financier, pedophile. Oh yeah, you think? Talk about bad publicity. You got the the, the two uh, sick bastards, Epstein and Woody Allen, strolling onto MIT's campus after they've both been in the news recently, Epstein especially. And I'm sure that would have created a bit of a stir among some, but really, would have it mattered? The powers that be don't care, obviously. So, you know, at the end of the day, they wouldn't have gave a damn as long as that $250,000 is coming in, as long as that five hundred grand is coming in, as long as Epstein still has the checkbook out. And nobody was paying attention back then, really. Very few people. And nobody really cared. This case had, didn't have legs yet. The national uh, legacy media hadn't picked it up yet. They hadn't talked about it at all, even though there were survivors screaming from the rooftops. Yet Allen apparently had no qualms about consorting with a convicted sex offender who served jail time in 2008 and 2009 for soliciting an underage girl and appeared to stay close to him until his death. In New York, Epstein was registered as a level 3 offender, meaning he was a threat to public safety and at high risk for, for committing similar crimes again. So, in layman's terms, every scumbag you see on that Chris Hansen show, wrapped up into one, and times by a thousand, and that was Jeffrey Epstein. And Woody Allen thought it was a good idea to hang out with this level 3 sex offender, to hang out and cavort with him. I don't know about you folks, but I don't know any sex offenders. And I'm not hanging out with any of them, that's for sure. Certainly not going out to the their house to have some bread and dinner, or whatever the hell it is these idiots were eating. Not going for a stroll in Central Park anytime soon. It is absolutely ridiculous. The duo also reportedly had another mutual friend, Alan's former teenage mistress, model Christina Engelhart, who was 16 when she began dating the director in 1976. Their secret relationship lasted eight years, according to The Hollywood Reporter. So, obviously, Woody Allen has a pattern of this behavior. He likes young girls. That's what it is here, okay? Let's just call it facts what they are. Facts, man. I'm not beating around the bush with this dude. Obviously, this dude and Jeffrey Epstein shared the same proclivities. Now, I'm not saying Woody Allen was engaging in abusing the girls that Epstein was trafficking. Nobody's come out and said that anyway yet. But I will tell you this, he certainly enabled Jeffrey Epstein. And if the allegations against him can be, uh, can be believed, well, like I said, there is a spot for him right next to his pal and Epstein and the bottom rung of hell. And they can take all the strolls they want together for eternity. Engelhardt tells the Daily Beast that she worked as a personal assistant for Epstein in the, 19, in the early 80s, back when he was only a millionaire and wasn't there yet when it came to sex trafficking underage girls. She says she told Epstein that she dated Allen, but that the two New Yorkers weren't friendly yet. So that goes back to the early 80s as far as trying to put the pieces together of Epstein and Woody Allen's friendship. So according to... Um, Christina Engelhardt here, who dated Woody Allen, they weren't friendly yet. So, they probably, my guess would be, their friendship started sometime late 80s, early 90s, probably. Nothing surprises me with either one of those men Engelhardt offers. I still am shocked that these very talented people choose these sadistic paths that bring them down. There's nothing good about it. Yeah, that's a pretty fair statement. Imagine having all that wealth, all that talent, and you use it to be a sick bastard, a sick prick. Hell is wrong with these people, man. I can't even imagine having that kind of dough. I can't even imagine having that kind of power or that kind of influence. The first thing I would do is go and help these homeless people that want to be helped in, in, my, in my city. That would be the first thing I would do. Who the hell's thinking about abusing people or setting up sex trafficking rings? What kind of devious, sick, demented 
Fuck. I don't not even enough words to describe how sick you have to be for that to be your grand plan. And then to pal around with somebody like that? Willingly? Working for Epstein eventually became toxic, and Engelhardt decided to flee to Italy to serve as an assistant and muse to director Federico Fellini, whom she says was a lovely man. As for her time with Alan and Epstein, Engelhardt says, I escaped one monster and ran away from the other. Wow. So this is somebody who would know, right? And again, this is just her. These are her allegations. This is what she, th- she says. Her personal experience with Epstein and Woody Allen. So like, what do I always say on the podcast, folks? For me, anyway, it's more important to hear it from the horse's mouth, right? Directly from the source. I don't need a reporter to explain to me what's going on here. Just give me the raw data. Give me what's going on. Give me that. Give, me, give, give it to me straight. Woody is a bad guy, she adds, and the documentary really helped open my eyes to just how bad. So I got to watch that documentary. Now, I, now I'm very interested after the great Kate put this article out here. I'm very interested now to do a dive into this Woody Allen scuzz bag. In December 2010, Allen attended a lavish dinner at Epstein's residence, toasting Britain's Joe Exotic of the Windsor family, a.k.a. Prince Andrew, who faces abuse ac- accusations himself from Virginia Roberts, an alleged survivor of Epstein's. So, I mean, again, how many times do we got to say this and talk about this on the podcast? These guys are all hanging around. It's like a club of, of sick perverts. The Perverts Club. You know, like in, in the movie It, it was the Losers Club. All the kids that were living in Derry, uh, uh, you know, that banded together to fight the, the clown monster, Pennywise. That's these guys. But they're the Perverts Club. And they, they're hanging out together to destroy everything that's good and decent, it would seem. Other celebrity guests at the soiree included TV journalist Katie Couric. Oh, isn't that nice? Charlie Rose, who was absolutely a scumbag and in deep with Epstein. A guy that Epstein had very, very, very close ties to and maybe even had his hooks into, to be honest with you. I have an episode where I dove in to the Charlie Rose-Epstein um, relationship in the catalog. If you're interested in that, you might want to check that out. And George Stepanopoulos, publicist Peggy Siegel, and comedian Chelsea Handler. This is what I was talking about. All of those people, what's up? You guys are all at this dinner with all of these perverts? I mean, we're talking about three perverts, bro. What is really going on here? And then you're, you're going to get on the news in your, your clog-ass platforms, George Stephanopoulos, you little scoundrel. Get on the news and talk down to anybody else like you have some sort of platform to stand upon that is above the rest of us. I have news for you, my friend. Even with the clogs, even on your ivory tower, you're in no position to talk down to anybody. You're here breaking bread with Jeffrey Epstein. Back then, Daily Mail columnist Richard Kay reported that Andrew was in a jolly mood, especially when other guests, including Hollywood star Woody Allen, asked him for an invite to the upcoming nuptials of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Yeah, he probably charged them for that too, right? The Joe Exotic of the Windsor family. Always trying to turn a couple of bucks. Always trying to make some sort of deal. Always hanging out and getting large on the teat of some sort of scumbag. Handler recently spoke up about the event, which she described as weird, claiming she tagged along with Couric and was seated next to Alan and Soon Yi. When we got there, I was like, what is this gathering? Handler recently said on Rob Lowe's podcast. We had dinner, and it was so awkward and so weird. I was like, what are we doing here? And then I asked Woody Allen how he and Soon Yi met, and that was when I left. Um, What? See, uh, that doesn't ring true to me. What that rings as to me is, oh, well, I'm going to pass this off. I was as, I was Katie Couric's one, her plus one. I don't know what we were doing there. I don't know Jeffrey Epstein. Where have we heard that defense before, folks? And then Rob Lowe just letting her off the hook. I mean, okay, I guess if that's what you want to do, young blood. I really was curious, Handler added. I had forgotten for a moment, but as it came out of my mouth, I knew that it was too late. Alan, however, 
was apparently amused. And he loved it. And Sun Yi, I don't think she heard it. Oh, how awesome, how great, what a fantastic story, Chelsea Handler. Give me a break with these people. Epstein reportedly decorated his New York home with photos of himself and famous friends, including Alan, former President Clinton, the Mo- Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, who ordered the assassination of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Well, that's a whole different uh, d- topic that we could go into, and I, I don't really agree with positing Khashoggi as uh, uh, some sort of uh, hero. He's a gray character and as gray as they come. Now, MBS most certainly is not a good person either, right? So we're talking about a lot of gray characters here and a lot of context that is always missing from the conversation. Following Epstein's suicide, allegedly, whilst awaiting trial on charges of sex trafficking minors, New York Times scribe James B. Stewart detailed visiting Epstein's Manhattan mansion in August 2018 and spotting the snapshots with Allen and Clinton, displaying photos of celebrities who had been caught up in sex scandals of their own also struck me as odd, Stewart wrote, adding that Epstein called him a week later and invited him to a Saturday dinner with Allen. The reporter declined. It shouldn't strike you as odd. That was done purposely. Symbolism is very big with these people. And the symbolism is, I am the man. That's what Epstein was saying by having those photos on the wall. I'm the man. This is my universe. You're in my atmosphere. And if you want to play ball, I'm the kingmaker. That's what those pictures meant. And the blackmail he had on these people, all of that played into it. You don't just have power over these people. What do you think? People like Bill Clinton are going, you know, he's going to cede power to you? I mean, come on. The overriding impression I took away from our roughly 90-minute conversation was that Mr. Epstein knew an astonishing number of rich, famous, and powerful people and had photos to prove it, Stewart continued. He also claimed to know a great deal about these people, some of it potentially damaging or embarrassing, including details about their supposed sexual proclivities and recreational drug abuse. And there it is again, folks. I mean, we have so much circumstantial evidence about the blackmail scheme that was being run by Epstein and Maxwell that you you really can't deny it. And it's very hard to not give it a good look. You know, there's people who still don't really believe the blackmail scheme. They think that, you know, people still think that it was just Epstein was just a sick guy. And I just don't see how you can come to that conclusion when you look at the whole story overall. Now, have some people went a little far in in what they think is going on with Epstein? In my opinion, yes, of course. Like with Maxwell, I don't believe she was a spy per se. She wasn't trained by, say, the Mossad or the CIA, in my opinion, but was she an asset? I think she was. Allen wasn't Epstein's only Hollywood connection. The financier, pedophile, was friendly with disgraced film mogul, pedophile, molester, a woman abuser, disgusting-faced, mongrel, Harvey Weinstein, who allegedly tried to attack a woman in Epstein's orbit. His Rolodex included a host of other celebrities, including media investor Ron Burkle and actors like Kevin Spacey, Alec Baldwin, Elizabeth Hurley, and Minnie Driver. Kevin Spacey's name sure seems to pop up quite a bit with these people, right? And again, there's no evidence that that Spacey was abusing anybody within the Epstein atmosphere, but who the hell knows what sort of compromise that Epstein might have had on somebody like Spacey. Because you know Spacey was a sick dude according to what people said. So Epstein probably set him up in a couple of compromising situations, right? If, If that's the way Epstein rolls. As the Daily Beast previously reported, Epstein and Allen also had mutual friends in Paris. Former French politician Jack Lang, who has publicly defended Allen amid Dylan's child sex abuse allegations, claimed he met Epstein in 2012 at a party hosted by Princesses Camilla of Bourbon to Sicilies. The socialite threw the party in Allen's honor. 
these people, folks, I'm telling you right now, all of the cheering and the carrying on for royals and monarchs and, oh, it's a princess. Oh, he's a prince. It's, it's disturbing in the, in the 21st century. I mean, what the hell are we doing? These people, they don't care about you. They care about the tax dollars continuing to feed money into their treasury. But besides that, what the hell, what value are these so-called royals bringing to anyone's lives? What are they, figureheads? Plenty of people better to do that job, in my opinion. How about some fantastic scientists from these countries who have uh, uh, done great things for um, America or for whatever country we're talking about? What about people like that? Where are they at? One survivor of Epstein even mentioned meeting Allen in a lawsuit she filed against the financier pedophile's estate. The woman, referred to as Priscilla Doe, says she was a 20-year-old dancer in New York when Epstein began abusing her in 2006 until 2012, including when he was on work release at the Palm Beach County lockup. On one occasion, Jeffrey Epstein forced Priscilla Doe to serve hors d'oeuvres at Epstein's private party with Woody Allen, Doe's lawsuit states. So this, this girl says that she was being held in servitude and being forced to work at Woody Allen's party serving hors d'oeuvres. And Woody Allen hasn't been called to the carpet here, has he been talked to under oath? Why not? This server's role was forced upon her in order to demean her, frighten her, and impress upon her the need, the need for her to conceal the commercial sex trafficking enterprise he was running. Asked about Doe's complaint, her lawyer Brad Edwards said, Woody was a very close friend of Epstein's. They hung out quite frequently. I cannot comment beyond that. So, folks, look, once again, just another example of the so-called elite hanging out together, commiserating, covering for each other, and basically just being all around scummy. And I don't think it should surprise anybody at this point that Woody Allen would be such good friends with somebody as disgusting as Jeffrey Epstein. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y uh, underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. To everybody who has donated to the podcast recently and in the past, thank you folks so much. All right, everybody, I will be back tomorrow morning and we'll kick back in with our regular, our regular schedule. So until then, I hope you all have a fantastic night and I will talk to you tomorrow. Imagine an ER waiting room with your favorite blanket and pillow, your cat's pixel and widget, and your mom's chicken soup. At Dignity Health, we know the only thing worse than being in pain is being stuck in an ER waiting room. So we offer in quicker. You get an estimated ER arrival time online so you can start your wait at home. It's just another way of putting leading edge medicine within easy reach. Learn more at strosehospitals.org slash ER. Dignity Health, including St. Rose Dominicans, Rose de Lima, San Martin, and Siena campuses in Henderson and Las Vegas. Hello, human kindness. Sun, surf, and seduction collide as four Americans return to exotic islands hoping their sexy romances can turn into forever. Love and Paradise, The Caribbean, a 90-day story, streaming now only on Discovery+. Plus. Start your free trial. Terms apply.